The following program is a Creative Magic Network production. Alrighty, hello, hello, guys. Come on in, come on in. Sit down, relax. Have a cup of coffee. Maybe have a cup of water. I have a cup of water right beside me right now. And welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to have you guys here. I am Fred. Welcome. Welcome to the Frederick Bai Show. Yes, this podcast is about unleashing your creativity. We talk to experts. We step into the unknown. It is a match of inspirational, intuitional radio podcast as we chat with charismatic enigmas. That's right. Musicians, singers, radio, business people, photographers. Everything in between. The tower of power too sweet to be sour, funky like a monkey. Hey, in this place, sky is the limit and space is a place. I am Frederick By, and I am a f- your favorite, favorite French Canucker. I am a mother Canucker. I am a, I'm your host. I'm a writer. I'm a friend. I'm an artist. I'm an animal lover. And, <laughs> and today is a special edition of the Frederick By show. Yes. You know why? Because we're going back in time. Yes, one of the best interviews that I've done with was with Corey Huff. And for those of you out there, just a few of you out there, you know, to me, today's subject that we're going to talk about really taps into what I think 99% of the artists of all of you out there want, uh, need to learn. Um, it's all about selling your art online because guess what guys, there's that myth. I don't know if you ever heard it, but there's that myth of the starving artists and I don't know about you, but that's BS to me. And that's, you know, it's BS to me. There's no other word. There's no, just no other way to put it. And, um, this guy, uh, Curry Huff, uh, is the uh, founder of the abundant artists.com. And I'm so proud to bring you this incredible conversation once once again with one of the most sought after coach and teacher in the biz. If you've ever questioned yourself on how to sell your art online, this is the guy, this is the dude to go to. He's a coach. He, he's been doing it for almost, almost 10 years, actually. That's right. Because in 2009, Curry started abundance, abundantartist.com as a way of teaching internet marketing to his artist friends who were seeking him for help. And, you know, since then, he's helped dozens of artists go from never sold anything to now selling pieces monthly and weekly. Some of some of his artist friends and clients have gone on to sell their work for $20,000 or more. Isn't that amazing? That's just amazing. He teaches artists to dispel the starving artist myth. Yes, by using the web to sell art directly to their fans. If you want to get into a gallery or museum, the marketing skills he teaches can help you do that. That's right. And building your own business online can be complementary to a gallery business for the right artists and galleries. I'm so proud to bring you this once again. Uh, it's one, Like I said, it's one of my favorite, favorite piece of uh, the, the, the Friedrich Bayer Show. At the time, it was the, the title of the podcast, of the radio podcast was um, Creative Magic Unchained. So, don't be surprised if you hear that, uh, you know, if you hear that during the, the, the podcast. Um, but you know what? I'm going to stop babbling. It's all about Curry Huff, the abundant artist, and it's all about you not starving, <laughs> you being abundant today. So without further ado, let's get to it right after this. <laughs> Hey guys, if you have a passion, you know, something that fuels your curiosity, what you're going to do now is you're going to join our creatives community. Why? Well, first, because you're going to get a free anthology of 25 inspirational quotes about living a happy life from the inside out, cataloged by the ambassador of happiness herself, Maura Sweeney. The second thing, you're going to get a free exclusive conversation with Alex Okoroji and the blind blogger. We talk about the influence of friends and college education on our careers and lives. We talk about the competitiveness in a crowded field. We talk about the business and financial education in arts and entrepreneurship. And Alex Okoroji has a special gift for you. Her book, The Naked Truth, just because you're a listener. 
You can get it for free. You're going to go to frederickbuy.com. That's frederick with a C. Buy like bye -bye dot com. Enter your email. It is really that simple. Hello, hello. So we are here with Corey Huff. He's a creator of the AbundantArtist.com, helping artists making a living from their art. He's, he's also the author of How to Sell Your Art Online, Live a Successful Creative Life on Your Own Terms, available now for pre-order. How are you today? I'm very good. How are you? I am Thanks. I am fabulous. I am fabulous. Thanks, um, thanks so much for having me today, Frederick. Hey, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, we're honored. Um, all right. So right, right before we dive into uh, your your current endeavors, you're doing a bunch of stuff. You're working with artists, which which is just awesome. <laughs> um, uh -huh. g g give us a, uh, an idea here of your uh, your background. Sure. Uh, so I started The Abundant Artist about six years ago. I uh, have an artistic background myself. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in acting and theater. Um, all my friends are performers, artists, and entrepreneurs. And uh, when I graduated from college, I uh, got a job for an internet marketing company, a little boutique agency, and I was trying to figure out you know, how do my, how am I going to bring together all of my interests in all of my cre creative and artistic pursuits and, and make a living from that? And because I had this day job, I, I got a glimpse into this world of internet marketing and I started using what I was learning to get people out to my shows, get people out to my friends' shows. And I started reaching out to other creatives and saying, what are you doing? How are you doing it? And uh, having their interviews on my blog. And basically, it just grew from there. People liked what I was blogging about, and uh, we we sort of built up this core community of people that were really enthusiastic about the idea that artists can make a living from their work. So, uh, fast forward six years, we've got classes. We've got a, I've got a book coming out, which you mentioned. We've got a conference this summer, uh, and we just have this really great community of artists who are making it happen. And I'm lucky enough to be serving that community. See, let, let me ask you this: You grew up. You, you grew up. You 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 went to school um, uh, for acting. Mm -hmm. um, how, what was the mentality of, of the, what was the mindset of, of the adults around you uh, when you grew as you were growing up? Where, where, as, as it pertained to creativity and those kind of those kinds of endeavors. Sure, you know, I did not grow up in a artistic family. Uh, my my family's mostly laborers, uh, retail jobs, that kind of stuff. Uh, my family, I grew up pretty poor, and my but my mother was very supportive of all the things that I was interested in. Right, like when I was in my introduction to the arts was in fourth grade. I, I talked too much in class, and so my teacher told my mom that she should enroll me in summer drama camp. So my mom managed to scratch together enough money to do that, and I got into theater when I was in fourth grade. And my mom didn't know anything about it. Nobody in my family knew anything about it, but I loved it. And my mom was really kind enough to support me in doing this thing that I was interested in. And from there, I, I just pursued it, you know, as, as much as I could in as many places as I could. And in high school, I was in a touring Shakespeare troupe. And I, I really just loved theater. And it kept me from getting in trouble. It kept me out of drugs, kept me out of some of the stuff that uh, I had, I, that was going on in my life growing up. And so, so theater and the arts were really a, a place of solace and safety for me. And when it came time to figure out what I was going to do when I grew up, I, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything other than going into the arts. See, see, that's interesting because many of us grew up in families where, okay, our, our parents are so rational. They're accountants, they're engineers, they're this, they're that. And, hey, dad, I want to be uh, an actor. I want to be a painter. What? No, no, that's not going to happen. You need to go to school. You need to. All right. So if, if a 19-year-old was going to come to you and, and ask you, um, you know, hey, hey, look, I have to make a career decision here. I don't know what to do. I, I want to be an artist, but it's, it's not a, a, you know, it's not. It's not a, a certain work. <laughs> it's, it's, un, it's an, un, you're going to live a life of uncertainty. Like, you, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and he, the person hesitates between that and having a, you know, a, a regular job, a, a career, an engineer. Sure. What would mm -hmm. you tell that person? I would say don't make your career decisions based on fear. Don't make your career decisions based on 
you know, one career being more secure than, the, than another, um, security to a certain extent is an illusion. Mm, you know, oh the, yeah. the, the idea that, that your engineering job will be around forever is sort of a myth. Uh, you know, our, our, as technology advances, our careers change rapidly, right? And so I think that, you know, if you value security and stability and you value being able to do the same thing every day, then, you know, an artistic path might not be for you. But if you're somebody who, you know, if you have a passion for art, do it. Um, and I will say, you know, being an artist is a hard career. It's not, it's not something where you just get up and go to work and you mindlessly go through the day and then come home. Like you, you really have to be engaged. Uh, it's, it's difficult. You have to be an entrepreneur. You have to hustle. You can't just make art. You got to also learn how to run a business, how to promote yourself, how to network and interact with people. Uh, you, you have to be willing to do all of those things in order to have a successful art career. I don't know anybody. I, I, sh- I should take that back. There are a very, very small number of artists who just sit there and make art all day. Uh, and, and even then, that's not all they do all the time. They even, even the, the artists at the very top of the game, they're still dealing with contracts, dealing with you know, business stuff. Uh, you just don't hear about that part. But you know, for most artists, it takes up a very substantial portion of their careers. So if you're willing to dive in and learn all of that, definitely pursue an artistic career. But don't let fear of doing it stop you. See, you're, you're in the business of, of business. I mean, you coach artists. So you get into the minds and the souls of the artists. And you're one. And you're one, too. You know, um, mm-hmm. Many artists, and I speak to many artists, and I'm around writers a lot, and uh, many of them will say, uh, look, um, I, I don't want to do all the marketing stuff. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like, it, it's an obstacle. It's like, it's, ugh, I gotta do that, really? <laughs> like, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and yeah. I just want to write. And I get that. I totally get that. What would you say to some, because I hear that a lot, just, you know, mm-hmm. oh, uh, the publishing company will take care of that stuff or the, 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 the music label will take care of that stuff. What would you, mm-hmm. what would you tell them? Um, I'll say you think that the publishing company will take care of it. You think that the art gallery will take care of it. You think the music label will take care of it. And they will to a certain extent. They will do these big companies that sell, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of art. Uh, they have their system. Right. And for every artist that they bring into their system, uh, you know, 80% of those artists won't go anywhere. They won't sell very much. And then 20% of them will sell a huge amount of art. And the, that, those small 20% of artists, they subsidize the risks that these bigger companies take on all the other artists. Right. So they have their system. And if you come along and you get plugged into their system and it works, then boom, you're, you're good to go. You know, you're the next Taylor Swift. You're the next, uh, Jeff Koons, your whatever, right? Uh, but most artists don't work in the system. And that's not because the art isn't good. There are plenty of artists who get plugged into the big corporate art sales systems who don't work out. Um, but they can do it on their own. Uh, Amanda Palmer is a good example of a musician who's like that. She had a following, a solid following that she was, and she was making a living from touring shows, selling records, selling merchandise. And she had a big enough independent following that Roadrunner Records came along and they gave her a record deal and, uh, and she got into that and they put an album out and, and it didn't go well. They didn't, she didn't sell enough records for Roadrunner to give her uh, more attention And she was actually making less money while she was working with them than she was working on her own. And so she figured out a way to get out of her contract and went off back to working on her own. And now she's doing great again. And you can read all about that in her book, The Art of Asking. Uh, she's a great example of an artist who made it on her own and who, who doesn't work in the system because she's not a popular enough artist. Her work isn't mainstream enough to work in the corporate system. But she's got this 
awesome connection with her fans. And then what happened is, you know, for the first few years, she did it all on her own. She, you know, she did all the hustling. She sold all the tickets. She handled all the business. But then as her fan base grew and her revenue grew, she was able to hire a manager and able to hire other people to handle the day-to-day business operations so that she could be out there making music and connecting with her fans and doing the things that she's really good at. And that's the path that you have to follow as an independent musician or independent artist, writer, musician, painter, whatever. You have to get out there, grow your following, and and handle your business until you have enough money coming in that you can hire somebody to handle the business for you. And that's just the way that it works. Um, all right. In business, in, in many, many things, we, we talk about the 90-10 rule, you know, 10% of the people, 10%, 10% of the actors make 90% of the money, 10% of the entrepreneurs make 90% of the blah, blah. Okay. So does it, does it apply also to like, you know, what does, what do the 10% do that the 90% don't? They do the work every day. What work? Yeah. Uh, it's finding the people who are potentially interested in what you do and connecting with them. Uh, and, and that can take a lot of different forms. It can be, you know, getting out and doing interviews with magazines and newspapers and blogs. It can be connecting with people on social media. It can be connecting with people on your mailing list. It can be going out and, you know, doing book tours, doing music tours, um, you know, showing your work at art fairs and in the streets. It's, it's spending the time to get out there and, and show your work. Right. Uh, Austin Cleon's book is, so great because it, his book show your work is so great because he just basically spends the entire book saying show your work you know whatever way that means whatever that means to you get out there and show your work mm-hmm. and everything else is secondary make the work show the work that's what it all comes down to and the artists that i see who don't make it uh they there's this sort of lie that they tell themselves where they say i'm i'm showing my work but they're not actually showing their work what they're doing is they do a show like once or twice a year and if it sells then they do well and if it doesn't sell then you know they just then they, then they're broke and until the next show but there are lots of ways to show your work and in the you know when, with social media and the internet there's no excuse to not be able to show your work to as many people as possible and to spend time doing that on a regular basis. I won't say every day because different people divide up their schedule different ways. Some artists spend, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday creating and they, you know, promote themselves and market themselves on Tuesday and Thursday, whatever works for you, but making sure that you're spending enough time marketing yourself. Once again, we're here with Corey Huff. He is the creator of the abundant artist.com, helping artists making a, li- a living from their art. He's also the author of a brand new book, How to Sell Your Art Online, Live a Successful Creative Life on Your Own Terms, available f- for pre-order now. All right. Um, a lot of people, a lot of artists uh, suffer from self-doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure you, you, you encounter that. I have, yes. <laughs> you, it's kind of like we have a, uh, we have a personal self esteem and I think we kind of have a creative self esteem where we don't, we no longer trust our creativity. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I do. Absolutely. Yeah. You like the, the whole, you know, oh, this is awesome. Well, maybe this, this is okay. Oh man, this is, this sucks. And you like, it's the, <laughs> I get it. Like the creative process is really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, like what if I'm not good enough or whatever? Um, mm-hmm how how would you advise an artist you know who's suffering in a way from that because you know it's sure (laughs) yeah so art doesn't have to be better than mediocre to sell and sometimes not even then okay repeat that sorry sorry (laughs) art doesn't have to be better than mediocre to sell and i'll attribute that quote to my friend gwen Seamel. she's a painter um used to live here in portland now she lives in virginia and the, the reality is that we see a lot of crappy art sell, right? Whatever, whatever creative field you're in, you know, you got all those mystery novels, those, those drop mystery novels that are written factory style with 20 authors and, you know, they sell millions and millions of books. Like whether or not that's good writing, a lot of people would say it's not. Those books sell a lot. Uh, you get a lot of mediocre pop music that sells millions of, of records. You got a lot of mediocre art. You know, everybody. The, the example everybody loves is Thomas Kincaid. Uh, was his good work? Was his work good or not? Who knows? But everybody seems to think it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yet he sold millions of dollars. So it's not about whether or not you're good. Like every artist goes through cycles of good work and bad work, and 
quite frankly, like as long as you keep cranking out work, some of it's going to be really good. Some of it's going to be terrible. And when you look back at your career over a, over a period of time, you'll be able to see what, what was and wasn't good, what worked and what didn't work. And it's a matter of just giving yourself the gift of discipline to continue making, continue creating, continue pumping out new work so that you give yourself an, an opportunity to have more hits. Mm-hmm. All right. So, I mean, every type of, um, uh, of endeavor, um, especially the arts, it's very competitive. It's very, very competitive. Um, it's like being an entrepreneur, you know, mm-hmm. um, what, you know, I'm not original enough. Okay. That goes through my head. Uh, you know, or, or like, uh, you know, someone else is doing it better. I think it's hard to create when you're in that competitive mode. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How can you overcome that? You know, uh, like, 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 let's, let's say, okay, I know I'm going to go into into this art gallery or I'm going to put, produce this, this book and, I know so and so is going to be there. I know so and so is going to be in direct competition with me, or you know whatever. Um, I mean, how do you deal with that? It's very hard to me. To me, you have to kind of be at peace <laughs> in a peaceful place to create. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, just me. How do you deal with that? How do you over- overcome that? Uh, I think comparison is the death of creativity, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. you have to. For myself, I have to lean into what makes me unique as an artist. Uh, and usually the thing that makes a, a, an artist unique is they're, you know, they have a un, unique take on the world. They have some sort of uh, flaw or uh, mm. abnormality in their voice or in their style uh, that makes them unique. Uh, you know, I was just watching, I was just watching videos of Joni Mitchell singing last night and her voice sounded terrible. Right. Like, look, like looking back, I had just been watching some other singer who was had an amazing voice of perfect technique. Um, Joni Mitchell had a terrible voice and she looked like she was about to die when she was performing. But there was a passion in her in her flawed persona and it made her so unique and so different. And I think people really responded to that. And that's why we talk about her. Um And Joni Mitchell's not the artist that I'm thinking of. I said Joni Mitchell. I meant, uh, who did I mean? She's a famous singer from the 70s, and I can't remember her name right now. I'm sure I'll remember it later. Uh, anyways, the, the point is there's a lot of artists who are afraid to be who they really are. Um, there's this, this is a great story. I'll share this. Wow. Uh, Okay. Yeah. yeah go tell the story, yeah, but tell so, us why yeah. after that, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I think this story will answer the why question too. Okay. So uh, a few years ago, I was working with an artist uh, based in, in the East Coast of the U.S. She was young in her early 20s. Uh, she's a painter, and she was having some moderate success. She was selling uh, some oil paintings of flowers and puppies and things like that, just sort of standard stuff that you learn how to paint and draw in art school. She was a recent art school, art school graduate. And, and, and her work was okay. She was having a, a little bit of success, but she wasn't really happy with where she was. So we spent a lot of time over several phone calls uh, looking at her work, talking about positioning and marketing and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I was combing through her website while we were on a call. And I, and I, she had, she's pretty prolific. She put out a lot of work. And I scrolled through a couple pages of her work and I sent, and I, and, and I saw this completely different piece of work. It was different color palette. It was uh, still a flower, but it was a different color palette, a different texture, uh, just a very, very different take than anything else that she had done. And I stopped and I said, why is this buried seven pages deep in your website? This is your best work. And she started crying when, and she told me the story. She said that her family, you know, her, her family had discouraged her from being an artist. And so she had wanted to work really hard to prove to them that she could do it. So she had gotten, she had built up some very strong technical skills. She was good at drawing. She was good at painting. She had done very well in school, gotten all A's just to prove to her family that she could make it as an artist, that she could hit all of these check boxes. Um, but what she discovered was once she started, once she launched into her career and started selling her work, she had all this great technique, but 
when she when she was making the work that was true to her, the work that made her happy to make, her family didn't respond to it. Her family mm. looked at it and said, well, that's not what they taught you to do in art school, so therefore it's not good work. And so mm. she hid all of that work away and she stopped showing it to her family and she just made it by herself in her studio, didn't show it to anybody. But her one little act of rebellion was to put this one piece seven pages deep on her website. And I just, I said, you know, this is your best work. You should put this on your, the front page of your website and show more of this kind of work. And so she did. And like six months later, her career took off. She absolutely exploded in popularity. Wow. Her sales went up. She was much happier because she was selling the kind of work that she uh, wanted to be making. And, you know, I don't know what her relationship with her family ended up being like, but <laughs> uh, hopefully they were able to recognize that that she was making it as an artist because of her vision and because she was doing things that were not you know, what everybody else was doing. She was being true to her voice and following her voice. And if you listen to all of the experts and listen to this amazing interview with Rick Rubin, the music producer, and, you know, he's, he's produced millions of, of art. He's produced albums that have sold millions and millions of copies. He's had, you know, dozens of number one hits with all, artists in all kinds of different genres. And he said that what he tries to do with the musicians that he produces is he tries to help them get out of their own way. That his goal is to just say, mm-hmm. hey, you know, what kind of music do you really want to make? And, and then hold the artist accountable when they're making the music and saying, you know, you told me you wanted to do this. Is this are – you, are you embracing that? Are you changing direction? Or are you hiding from what you actually want to be doing? And I think that's absolutely brilliant. Wow. Um, I think you hit a very, very important point here. Her family did not like – what she did because it wasn't what she you know it wasn't what school told her was right basically yeah and it wasn't familiar to them right like yeah, they, they yeah, were yeah. not in the art world they didn't know that you know they don't know anything about abstraction they don't know anything about impressionism yeah. all that you know all they're familiar with is sort of the standard yeah. what you would see in a in a in a very safe art gallery right mm, yeah okay so uh, that brings me to another point um because i hear a lot of writers too and uh you know And, and just not writers, just people. Okay. Uh, you know, you should go to school in arts <laughs> to be an mm-hmm. artist. Now, mm-hmm. should I go to school in arts or not? Like, I think there's that it's debate. A, it's a, a big lot of, discussion. Yeah. yeah. It's a big, it's a big debate. Um, I don't think we can cover that. We could do a whole separate, we can do a whole okay. podcast okay. about whether or not people should go to arts, <laughs> a whole series of podcasts about that. But, um, here's, here's my thoughts on that. Um, art school, If you go to a good art school, right, one that's a top-tier art school, they're going to do a few things for you. They're going to teach you really great technique for the most part. Um, there's, there's sort of a movement in art school where, where they don't teach you the technical drawing skills that a lot of artists should have. Uh, and so you want to check and say, you know, is it important that I learn how to technically draw well? I think it is. Uh, but, you know, they're going to give you some good technique for the most part. And art schools are also going to give you alumni connections, They're going to give you connections to the art galleries and the crit and the critics and the other uh, people in the in the art world who can help you get started in your career. Um, now, that said, of the people who graduate from art school, only a very small percentage of those people sort of get picked by the people who who run the upper the upper echelon art galleries, right? Like you get the MFA students, and if there's a hundred of them that graduate, maybe. Five to 20 of those students will get picked by one of these great galleries and get a show and, and their work will start selling in the galleries. And all the other artists are sort of left to their own, up to their own devices to figure it out. And then they've got $200,000 worth of grad, of grad school debt, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. If you're going to go to art school, you know, can you afford it? Can you get a scholarship? Uh, do you need the technique training? Do you need the alumni connections? And uh, are you willing to spend, you know, two to three hundred thousand dollars to make that happen? Right. No, knowing that that debt's never going to go away. Uh, the, on the other hand, if you don't go to art school, you don't go to three hundred thousand dollars in debt. Uh, you are going to have to find some training, you know, whether you pick up some books or videos and teach yourself or you go find a teacher who can teach you. Um, you're going to have to work harder to build up your network and find the right teachers Uh, but you can get to the same level of technique at a fraction of the price 
the, the, the thing you're not going to get is the alumni connections. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily matter. Like if you, if you're smart about it, you can build up your own audience and, and, and make a great living that way. And in fact, most of the artists that I personally know who make a living from their work did not go to art school. Mm-hmm. So take that for what it's worth. And there's my cat, <laughs> my categories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. All right. Just before continuing this conversation for you, audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30 day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. I personally recommend the audiobook The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, or you can choose the audiobook of your choice for free by trying audible.com. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Fred. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Fred. You will be entertained, and at the same time, you will help a brother out. So, everybody wins. Go to audibletrial.com slash Fred for your free audiobook. Uh, all right. Once again, this is Gary Huff. He's the creator of theabundantartist.com, helping artists making a living from their art. He's the author of How to Sell Your Art Online. This is the online world now. Uh, live a successful creative life on your own terms available for pre-order now. All right. Uh, when, we're, when we're starting out as an artist... Um, uh, you know, let's say many people come, you know, I interview, I interview quite a few people now and it's like many of the story of I was in a corporate job. I hated it. Da, da, da. Then I decided to just become a painter or musician or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, however, you know, you go, okay, well, who's going to take me seriously as an artist? You know, because all of a sudden you change your title. And all of a sudden, you don't have necessarily, uh, uh, you know, uh, f- you know, five books. You didn't write five books, so you didn't paint, you know, that many paintings. And you put yourself out there, and it's like, who's going to take me seriously? What would you tell that person? Because it's nerve wracking when you get out there at first, mm-hmm. you know. People will take you seriously when you take yourself seriously. Mm-hmm. If somebody says, what do you do? And you, and you look them in the eye, shake their hand and say, I'm an artist. Mm. They have no reason to doubt you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're an artist. What kind of art do you make? I paint, I, I make oil paintings. Oh, okay. Where can I see your work? That's X, Y, and Z galleries, or you can see them at these cafes or these offices or this, or, you know, come to my open studio. Like, if you take your work seriously and you do the work to promote yourself and, and show your work in as many places as you can, mm-hmm. people will see that you are taking it seriously. And there's nothing wrong with being a beginner. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I'm just getting started. Uh, I am, you know, I've done X, Y, and Z things, but I'm just getting started. There's nothing wrong with that either. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I love the the quote from... Uh, Brene Brown quotes uh, Teddy Roosevelt in her book Daring Greatly, mm-hmm. and she talks about you know, the, the the gladiator in the arena. Have you heard this speech by Ted, from Teddy Roosevelt? Nope. Where he talks about um, you know there's a gladiator in the arena who is you know he's getting his butt kicked and he's uh, you know he's cut, his face is covered in dirt and he's bleeding, but you have to admire that guy because he's at least trying. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. And for myself, there's a lot of critics, right? Like there's a lot of people who will tell you what you're doing wrong or why you don't have any right to do what you're doing. And they're usually family members. Unfortunately, I only take criticism from people who are in the arena. I only take criticism from people who have bled yeah. people who have yeah. been dirty, people who know what it's like. I take that criticism criticism ser- seriously. Mm. If if they haven't been gotten dirty and they don't know what is going on and what I've been through, I ignore them. Mm-hmm. You know, oftentimes I I I, I say, it's often, you know oftentimes it comes from friends those type of critics. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it's really un- it's really unfortunate that <laughs> that our you know the people that are closest to us are the people that are ca- capable of cutting us the most. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Or they'll or they'll say like. Oh, this is good. This is good. Okay. But then they talk about something else, and they don't. They don't really care mm-hmm. what you do. You know, when you're starting out, because it's almost like they expect you to fail, or they expect you to at some point just quit it. 
Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you can't really blame them either, right? Because no, yeah, if, you, yeah. if you're starting something new, uh, you know, they have no idea if you're serious or not. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't know that you've actually spent eight hours a day for the last year yeah. painting, yeah. right? Yeah. Like they don't live in your world. So, you know, have a little bit of, have a, have a little bit of understanding and empathy for them as well, because I think that if they knew they were hurting your feelings, they would probably feel bad too. They probably have no idea and they don't know that they're hurting you. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on. Um, uh, all right, this is an online world today. Uh, there's so much stuff out there. Um, someone might think, hey, people, I will, I will put my spot there. I will uh, set up a website. I will, you know, I have a logo. I'll, have, I'll put my work out there and someone will steal my work or my ideas. How do you, how do you deal with that? What do you do? Who cares? Let them steal it. What? Yeah. <laughs> What? No, <laughs> you, you can't do anything about it. Like the, the odds that somebody steals your work and profits from it are very, very small. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you put your work up on a website. Somebody wants to right click and download your image and put it on a, and, and, and print it out to put on their own wall. Great. Their, their friends are going to see the crappy printed version of your work on their wall. If you're a writer and uh, you, you, you publish some work on your blog and somebody tries to reprint it, the best thing that you can do is make sure that as many people know about your work as possible so that when somebody comes along and tries to steal your work, they go, hey, that like everybody who sees it will go, hey, that's not yours. That belongs to that other guy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know who Lisa Congdon is, the illustrator? Uh, so she, a couple years ago, she had an, uh, an incident where a company actually stole a bunch of her images oh. and sold the turned around and sold the work to... Uh, Anthropology and West Elm and a bunch of other companies like that. And Lisa was able to – Lisa had a huge following because she'd been engaging with her followers for years. She had a big social media following. She had a big blog, a blog following. And she turned around and just made a bunch of noise. She said, hey, you know, Anthropology uh, – this company, Cody Foster, is stealing my work. And because of the social media for uh, Jezebel picked it up, Gawker picked it up, a bunch of other blogs picked it up, and it became national news for a few for a couple of weeks. And they were actually able to get it shut down without use without suing them. They got Anthropology and West Elm to to shut it down and stop stop selling that work. Um, if you worry about people stealing your work and you and you don't put yourself out there because you're worried about people stealing your work, you won't get anywhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. people steal stuff on the internet all the time. That doesn't mean that they're going to make any money off of it. Mm-hmm. Put yourself out there, get your work out there. Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah, because you can't really protect yourself anyway. Because you know it's worldwide now. Like, yeah. It, yeah, the only way the only way that the only way to protect yourself is to have enough money to sue, which means yeah, that, but that you got to have millions of dollars. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Or. Or you, your work is so ubiquitous and so well known that if somebody tries to steal from you, all your fans are going to say, "Hey, that person's that person's a thief." Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, let's shift gears. Um, everybody loves cold hard cash. We all want to make money, 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 money. Money rules the world, almost. Okay, so uh, and then art and the starving artists. You know, and I know it's one of your main, the main, one of the main themes that you address in, you know, on your website and your blogs and all that stuff. What's your mindset around art and financial abundance? Artists can make a living from their work. I know dozens of artists with six-figure businesses. Uh, the idea that just because you're an artist, you have to starve is completely false. And the idea that artists who make money from their art are selling out and making lesser work is also completely false. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. All right, that's it. You just the <laughs> no, but that's it. You have to I be direct. You, I, I mean, there's, there's nothing. That, that's that's how I feel about it. Like I've been doing this long enough. You know, I've got a friend. Uh, so here's the thing. Like, so many artists are like, you know, I like you can't make a living from your work. But what happens is you get all these artists who are succeeding, who are making money from their work. They're so busy running their businesses and making art and doing their thing that they're not out trumpeting to the world that they're making a living from their art. They're just out there doing their thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so not very many people outside of that artist's immediate circle know that they have a six figure business, Yeah, but I know dozens of artists that are in that position. Mm -hmm. And they do what you said earlier, marketing, blah, 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 you know, Mm -hmm. opening themselves out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. If um, If you, 
If you go over to if you go to our website theabundantartist.com and you click on the podcast category in the blog, uh, you can. We, I think we've got three dozen artists that we've interviewed about their businesses. All of those artists uh, at various levels of success. All of them making a living from their art. Mm-hmm. I, I I know you posted the actually last podcast was with a sculptor. The um, he's, he has like one million YouTube followers. Oh yeah, um, Leonardo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Oof. yeah, he's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He literally has 1.2 million YouTube subscribers. My gosh. Pretty, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and he's not doing anything special. Right? He's doing his stuff. He's doing his thing apparently. Yeah, you he's know? just showing people how to draw. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah. He, he, so he has a, a huge number of people that watch him draw. Uh, and then you know a, a small percentage of those people buy his work, mm-hmm. and he makes a living that way. All right, um, we all want to save money. We all want to, you know, when we make money, then we want to put, you know, a bit of money away for our future. Um, but as artists, oftentimes the money is variable. You know, it's like mm-hmm. we have variable income. How how can an artist, uh, you know, can manage his money on a variable income? Yeah, uh, this is not my area of expertise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you're not a financial advisor. I have, advisor, I, I, know have that, but... <laughs> I have a system that was set up by my wife. My wife is pretty good with the pretty good with the financial stuff. Uh, we've read a few books. Uh, there's a book called Profit First, P R O F I T. Uh, Profit First talks about how to run, uh, like how to pay yourself with a variable income, uh, and and the the, the basics are. You know, you take a certain percentage of your income every month and you put part of it into your business checking account, part of it into your – you pay yourself a certain percentage and then you pay the business a certain percentage. And uh, and then from that money, you give yourself a monthly salary. Mm-hmm. And then anything at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter that's left over in the business, go, uh, you can draw out as a, as a business draw. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's it, – it, It's difficult. You have to live on essentially a little bit less than your monthly average, right? So if, if one month, if, if over three months you make 3,000, 13,000 and 5,000, you know, then your, uh, three month average is 7,000. So you probably want to pay yourself, you know, something like four or $5,000 a month. So you have some money left over for taxes and expenses and stuff. Uh, and, And you just, you know, when you have a good month, you don't spend a bunch of extra money. You set it aside for later. Mm-hmm. Well, that brings me to my next question. Um, that's why I think I'm reading a few books. I'm listening to other podcasts, too. Uh-huh. And it's all about building passive income as artists. <laughs> What are some of the ways to build passive income as artists? Sure. I mean, there's a there's a few of them. If you're a painter or you make other visual art, uh, print on demand is a pretty interesting way of making passive income. So you essentially you upload high resolution versions of your work to these print on demand websites, and we have a list of those print on demand websites over at our website. And uh, when somebody comes to your website, they order a piece of art, uh, and then on the back end, it sends an order over to this other company. They will print the work for you and ship it to the person who buy it, who bought it and you don't have to actually do any of the fulfillment. Mm. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Um, you know, there's some comp- there's some complexities there dealing with print quality and, uh, and, and the actual sales process, uh, needs a little bit of tweaking, but you know, it's mostly passive income. Mm. Um, by the way, the idea of passive income where you set something and you make money and you never touch it doesn't exist. Mm. It's, you know, there are very, very few instances where passive income is completely passive. Why? Uh, Because it takes maintenance, you you have issues come up, stuff breaks, uh, you know, customer service where people aren't happy with something they bought. Uh, you know, when you get into growing your business up a little bit, and you have some employees, you got to manage people. Um, you, you know, the the idea that you can make money for no effort just it's it's just false. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I know you, you're in a better position to tell me, but it seems to be like real estate. Like it's not true that it's just, you know, you have to maintain the building. It's yeah. I mean, you can, but... you can hire somebody to maintain the building, but even then you still have to communicate with those people. You still have to, you know, there's a minimum level of effort. Uh, yeah. Mm. All right. So, uh, and I mean, next question about money, um, you know, uh, maybe it relates to what you said earlier, but 
fears. I mean, fear, it's a fear driven world and most people are driven by their fear and they live off their fear. Like, you know, that's all they know is fear. And one of the main fear when you start something new, it's like starting a business is the lack of money. And that prevents a lot of people from pursuing what they really want to do. Um, you know, what would you tell them? You know, Hey, I want, I wrote this book, but Hey, I don't have the money to pay for an editor. Or, you know, and, and, sure. but the stuff like that, you know, and, 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 and oftentimes they're in a good job, nine to five, they're getting the paycheck, everything's fine, da, 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 da. Then what? I'm going to go on variable income again? What would you tell this, these people? Yeah. Uh, the, the day job trap is really interesting, right? Like, there's a reason they call it golden handcuffs. You got <laughs> health insurance and you got, you know, all kinds of benefits and perks and all that kind of stuff. And you get to leave your job. Uh, at five o'clock or whatever and, and not think about it anymore. Um, some people have jobs like that. Some, some people's jobs, you know, have them on, on call all the time, whatever. Uh, but the idea that having a job creates this illusion of security, right? Because we as a culture have decided that having a job is somehow safer than working for yourself. Mm. Uh, And, and maybe it is, but I don't, I don't think so. I, I think that my situation that I'm in right now is just as stable as any other job that I could be in because companies close, they go out of business, they, they have, you know, a bad year and they have to fire employees. Um, conflict happens with your manager. Um, the other thing is if you are, you know, if you're thinking all the time about quitting your job and, and becoming an artist and, you know, writer or painter, sculptor, whatever, um, odds are you're probably unhappy mm -hmm. doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so if you're unhappy doing what you're doing and you're unable and, and you're not able to, to quit and, and do something that you really want to do, you're just going to be miserable until you make a change. Right. And I did that. Like I, I worked, was building the abundant artist. I worked a day job while I was doing this. And so I'd work 40, 50 hours a week at my day job. And then I'd work 40 hours a week building my business. And I worked 80 to a hundred hours a week and it was awful for a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm really glad I did it because now I have a business that not only supports me, but supports other people and helps other people. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Basically you're telling, just take the step forward and, 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 you know, and see what happens in a way like, be, you know, uh, be smart about it. Yeah, like, yeah, don't just yeah. don't just quit your job yeah, and yeah. walk away. But if you've got a if you've got a day job that is paying you and and you are able to put a little bit of money away, like hang on to that yeah. while you build your business on the side. And you got to be willing to suffer a little bit. Yeah. Right. You got to lean into it and say, okay, if I'm really going to do this, I've got a stable base that I can work from. So you know, Tuesday and Wednesday nights, I'm going to go work on my business and Saturday mornings, I'm going to get up early and work on my business. And I'm going to, I'm going to figure out a way to get 10 to 20 hours a weekend on my business to get started. And, you know, I'm just going to do that as much of that as I can, uh, while I've got this base and I'm going to save, you know, I'm going to cut my expenses and I'm going to save money, uh, that I, so that I can put that into the business and have some savings for when I quit my job. So I have a little bit of a runway, you know, I was in a position where I could, Uh, I was able to save a bunch of money and I built my business up to the point where it almost replaced my income uh, before I quit my job. Hmm. Right. And I think if you're, if you're able to do that, totally do that because that's a great position to start from. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right, let's move on. Next fear, rejection. Some people, it's like dating, man. They can't get out of their home and ask a girl out because they're afraid of rejection. And some people can can start something because they're afraid their their idea, their book, their painting will be rejected. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us, what would you tell that person? Yeah, I'd say give yourself some rejection therapy. You need to <laughs> you need to you need to go show your work to more people because uh, every artist gets rejected. Every single one from, from the very worst artist to the very best artist, everybody suffers from rejection. And a, most of the time, the rejection has very little to do with your work. It has everything to do with the taste of the person you're presenting it to. It has everything to do with the, the, you know, the, the experience of what that person is going through when they see your work. Uh, 
And a lot of times people just don't get it and that's okay. You're only, you're looking for the small number of people who get it. Mm-hmm. And, and really, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is um, there's a guy named Jia Jiang who uh, did this awesome rejection therapy experiment a couple years ago and he blogged about it where he uh, gave himself the challenge of being rejected at least once a day. And so he went around and he started asking people to do all these crazy things and and it was really like like crazy things. Like he, <laughs> really? he asked a cop if he could drive his cop car. Um, wow. And he asked uh, – he walked into a Krispy Kreme and he asked them if they could make him glazed donuts with the colors and shapes of the Olympic rings, right? like the Olympic ring logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he uh, went and knocked on somebody's door and asked if he could uh, – I think it was sunbathe in their backyard – and wow. the, cra- the crazy thing is uh, people said yes to all of those things. Really? Yeah. So like he, he – this is somebody who, who he had a failed business. And so and, – and he recognized that part of the reason the business failed is because he, will- he wasn't willing to, to reach out and get the help that he needed. So he gave himself some rejection therapy by going out and finding – trying intentionally trying to get rejected. Mm. And what he found out was that people are actually awesome and more than willing to help. And he ended up getting far more yeses than he thought he would. Wow. Wow. So usually if you're, if you're afraid of being rejected, uh, get in line. So is everybody else, yeah. uh, rejection is part of the process. You just have to be willing to experience rejection. And I get it. Like I, I'm, I'm afraid of myself. I, I hate being rejected too, but it's just part of the process. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people don't even reject you. They just are indifferent. Like, a, they, they like you may, you may show them their, the your, your painting, and they just have a glazed, you know, you know, what I mean, they don't care, or mm-hmm. they just don't answer your emails, or just and and these things are just they're small rejections. But sometimes indifference is even worse than rejection. <laughs> you know, it's even worse than a no. You know yep. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Indifference is definitely worse than a no. I would much rather have a no. Yeah. You know, when somebody doesn't answer your email, you can re- you can't really do anything. It's like, okay, <laughs> you know, anyway. Um, all right. Third, the third one, failure. Ooh, it, it sucks to fail. It hurts to fail. It's humbling to fail. Um, and many people are petrified by it because if they fail, no, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, they're, you know, they, oftentimes we, we think about our friends or we think about our, our <laughs> you know, what is so and so is going to say and blah, blah, blah. What would you tell that person? So if they don't want to start something new because they're afraid of failure. Uh, if you're, it's the same thing as rejection, right? You, yeah. you, we all fail. We, we have artistic project process. Pro, yeah, we have artistic projects that suck. We have, uh, you know, business partners that let us down. We have, uh, uh, moments of we have lapses of judgment where we lash out at people like we fail all the time as humans and and if we're not failing it's because we're not trying hard enough or we're not trying things that are challenging enough uh, failure is part of life you just have to embrace that as well yeah it's like it's, it's as you said like rejection if you're not rejected enough uh, yeah it means you're not doing something right that's you know Mm-hmm. It's, it's like what you just said, you know, if you're not failing enough, well, you're not trying hard enough. Anyway, <laughs> um, all right. Um, it's a business, you know, we, we agree on that. Uh, I mean, art, uh, you know, you want to make a living. I think, do, do you absolutely have to be a businessman to be a, to, to make a living from your art, do you think? I think you need to understand the basics. Yeah, yeah. All right, so many people are looking for the right agent, the right publisher, the right, you know, gallery, the... And, and, you know, you don't want to be screwed over. You don't want to be, you know, you want, you don't want to be around people who are unscrupulous or anything. What advice would you give these people? You know, because sometimes artists, their, their brains doesn't work business wise. Like, it, it, I don't believe that. I don't no. believe that at all. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think if you say I'm just not a business person or my brain just doesn't work that way, that's an abdication of your responsibility and power. If you have a mental illness, yeah, you know, yeah. if you have a mental illness that prevents you from uh, forming coherent thought, <laughs> looks like they're testing the fire alarm out here. Um, <laughs> if you have a mental illness that prevents you from uh, forming coherent thought, get treatment. Yeah. But business is not complicated. Business is not as hard as making 
a complex piece of art. Hmm. It's just not. Okay, great. So, so understanding the basics of what it takes to succeed in life uh, is is a minimum requirement. And anybody who says I'm just not a business person, I'm not a computer person, blah 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 blah, you're abdicating your responsibility. If you don't understand it or you can't comprehend it, find somebody to help you. Okay. You know, letting that stop you is just an excuse. Would you say uh, uh, you, when you have a contract in front of you for anything, for an agent, for anything to to I don't know, get a lawyer or something, or maybe I mean, if you can't afford a lawyer, then you know, read it and get some, you know, find some other friends, find some other people who have been there, who uh, have done it before, and get their advice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you can't afford a lawyer, th this is why you need to build up your own professional network. Uh, get some advice. You can you can get advice from people without having to to pay for it every time. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Um, all right, what is the number one habit of successful artists? Showing up and doing the work every single day. Okay. Well, that means so doing the work that means do, doing their art and doing the the other stuff, right? Marketing. Yep. Okay. Yep. Showing up, doing the work every single day. Okay. Um. Uh, all right. Uh, you take okay. What's the? How do you remain calm in uncertainty? You know, again, it's like being an entrepreneur. You, I mean, some people meditate. Some people. I mean, those emotions. You know, what's going to happen next? Oh my God, what's going to happen next? You know, how do you mean? How do you remain calm in uncertainty? <sighs> I don't think you have to remain calm. I mean, you have to retain your wits about you. Uh, but I think it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad or scared, but you also have to keep moving forward. Uh, you know, bravery is feeling the fear and doing it anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, courage is taking action in the face of, of something that is scary. Uh, you have to have courage. Okay. So just, okay. Just courage. I mean, there's no... There's not a rule book <laughs> on what to do, right? <laughs> no, I mean, things are scary. Life is scary. Bad things happen. People are mean. People lose their temper. People are rude. Uh, it, it is up to you to decide how you're going to react to those adverse situations. Nobody, nobody can make those choices for you. You have to, you know, yeah. move forward. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you're blocked and nothing comes to you? Keep working. Hmm. Right of it, like if you're a writer and you and you, I don't believe in writer's block. But if you're a writer, uh, if you're a writer and you have a writer's block, write about your writer's block. There's a reason. There's a reason that you're blocked. Write about that. Mm -hmm. If you're an artist and you don't have any ideas, uh, you know, make art about the lack of ideas that you have. Mm -hmm. It's usually down to fear. Or uh, there's something that you should be making art about that you're ignoring. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's exhaustion, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're just tired. Uh, you know, go take a nap. Go eat something. Make sure your blood sugar is normal. Mm -hmm. uh, go for a walk uh, and, and go back to it. Give yourself permission to take a little break. But, you know, writer's block that lasts days or weeks is mm -hmm. – it means that it's indicating something else is wrong. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that creativity is spiritual growth or is, is spiritual? I think it has a spiritual element to it. Um, I don't, I think that a lot of people equate artistic uh, activity or creative activity with uh, communing with God. And, and maybe it is to some extent, but I don't equate creative or artistic action with worship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the loneliness loneliness associated with creative work? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lonely. That's 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 how I deal with it. I'm lonely. Um, I, I think I do make an effort to make friends. This is a challenge for me. Uh, you know, I get the I get the inherent loneliness of making things. Um, because you can't, it's hard to make things with other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that a lot of very creative people have a tendency towards introversion. Mm -hmm. Um, but 
having a few close friends that you can get together with on a regular basis is nice. You know, cultivating friendships is is nice. We're gonna wrap this up. We got a few minutes left. Um, with your view on the future for artists in the coming years, we got online businesses now. We got Twitter. We got <laughs> all of that stuff. What's your view for artists in the coming years? I think that right now is a golden opportunity for artists to build their own audiences, to connect with people directly. Uh, it is an unfortunate reality that online social networks are consolidating around larger brands. It's becoming harder and harder to do a Google search and not have the top results be a large company. Mm -hmm. uh, so building your own audience at, right now will predict your future. Um, in general, uh, the trends I think are going to be towards Uh, giving artists opportun more opportunities to connect with uh, to connect with individual collectors and individual fans, mm -hmm. but I can see a future, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 years down the road, where even so much of social media is owned by large media conglomerates, just like traditional media is now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, I mean, what's a, you think there's a bright future? I do think I do think there's a bright future. I think innovation will happen. I think that there are going to be things besides Twitter and Facebook. There are going to be whether it's other social networks or some future version, you know, distributed networks or something like that. There's some some technology that's coming down the pipeline that's interesting that'll give people an opportunity to connect with with others directly. Uh, but I, I, you know, from what I've seen on Facebook and Twitter and other Uh, social networks that are owned by large companies, I think that's going to consolidate it into the hands of large brands. It's just the way that it works. All right. Um, you're, if you were stuck on an island, no one else, 500 bucks in your pocket, an internet connect connection, and a laptop, what would you do in the next seven days? That's the last, that's the last question. I would... I would probably write a one man show about being stuck on an island <laughs> and I would set up a website and maybe a YouTube channel and I would uh, do the show live on YouTube and ask people to uh, pay me for entertaining them so that I could get off the island. <laughs> All right. I got it. Hey, by the way, what's the number one action a one of your us can, can do now? You think start making And start connecting with people. Okay. Any way they can, by social media and all that stuff? Yeah, whether it's social media or in person, uh, whatever whatever may, way makes sense to you and you're able to do. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, cool. Hey, where can we find you? And uh, find your work and your book? Uh, Theabundantartist.com. All right. And, by, and then and what are the services we have? Oh, we're on all the social medias, Facebook and Twitter and yeah. all that, but... Theabundantartist.com is the best way to find out about us. Yeah, and you're doing uh, business coaching, right? Yeah, we do. We have classes about selling art online, and we and I do coaching as well. All right, cool. Hey, uh, Corey, that was uh, wow. That was informative. That was inspiring. Thank you very much for your. Uh, hey, thank you very much for your time. Basically, I, I really, really appreciate. And um, and that's it. And thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Alrighty, guys. Thank you so much, Corey. Thank you so much, Corey, for this amazing conversation. Um, you know, it's one that I did back in February. And I'm proud of it. I am proud of it. I think it's a very informative conversation. And it was one of my big, you know, one of my biggest one, actually. So, um, and by the way, guys, I would like to thank everybody who pledged our Patreon page. You are, you are really helpful to the, to the show and we are grateful for your help. In case you're wondering, Patreon is a simple way for you to contribute to the radio podcast every single month and get super cool exclusive rewards in return. I promise you will love the perks. Our Patreon page is at frederickby.com. Click Patreon in the header and the money is used to cover our production costs and enhancements. It is also used to cover our editing time and sharing to the different radio podcast channels. You can contribute for as low as one dollar. There's no excuse. No excuse. So, um, and also the Creative Magic Store, you have a bunch of things out there. It's open 24-7. 
Uh, you got recommended reading. You got jewelries, mugs, T-shirts, uh, socks, a bunch of things, bags. And, uh, you know, check it out. Just go, go check it out. Go to frederickby.com. Frederick with a C. Buy like bye-bye.com. And, uh, and just check out the Creative Magic Store. I think you'll find something that you'll like over there. And also, Amazon. If you are an Amazon shopper, guys, um, you can use our Amazon links at frederickby.com. And uh, the, um, when you do that, Amazon kicks back a few bucks to the, to the radio podcast at no additional cost to you. No hidden fees. No nothing. So if you like what you hear, you can help by going over to frederickby.com. Click on the blog page. And uh, actually, just click, just go on frederickbuy.com and click Amazon link in the sidebar for all your online shopping. We have them for Amazon USA, Amazon Canada, Amazon France, Amazon UK. Yes, the United Kingdom. We love them. It is really that simple. And you can bookmark it to find it easier. And finally, this podcast is FRWE free every time you download it on iTunes or Stitcher. So please go over there. Subscribe. It is listener supported. Tell a friend. Leave a five star review. It really helps really helps a brother out and um you know what it's time for me to ride off into the sunset guys until next time we're gonna have amazing conversation in two days yes uh actually you don't you might not care because you're, it's probably recorded <laughs> you're not listening to it live so uh until next time stay safe and don't forget live with purpose passion and love bye-bye